Hello, and welcome to History in 7 Facts, the history side of this channel. Every living thing on Earth carries with it a piece of history. That history is encoded in the form of DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. Year after year, geneticists learn to read this code in more precise ways, and as they do, they've opened up the door for a brand new way to look at history. But how? DNA is a gigantic molecule that encodes the actual blueprint of a living organism. It was first isolated by Friedrich Miescher in 1869, but we've come a long way since then. DNA is extremely complex, we could talk about it for a week and we still wouldn't be done. But for this video, to keep it simple, you need to remember just this. In humans and all eukaryotes, there are two types of DNA. Nuclear DNA located in, you guessed it, the nucleus of each cell, and mitochondrial DNA found in organelles outside the nucleus. Nuclear DNA is quite hard to study, especially after the death of the cell, as it degrades rapidly. Mitochondrial DNA though is a lot tougher, and scientists and archaeologists use this to study long gone creatures. Since animal mitochondrial DNA evolves faster than nuclear genetic markers, it represents a solid support for evolutionary biology. It also permits an examination of the relatedness of populations, and so has become important in anthropology and biogeography. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the mother and remains largely unaffected by sex or natural selection. By knowing these facts, scientists are able to compare ancient mitochondrial DNA to that of different populations from different periods, thus enabling them to uncover a genetic timeline for each studied specimen. Mitochondrial DNA changes occurred due to mutations caused by natural radioactivity. Of course, man-made radioactivity can also change DNA, but that's a story for another time. Natural radioactivity is relatively constant and calculable, so in fact it's possible to count the mutations in mitochondrial DNA to find out its age. This is how we know that Homo sapiens appeared on the scene some 200,000 years ago. That's the age of the oldest molecules of mitochondrial DNA that can still be found in modern humans. Of course, 200,000 years is just an estimate, and it's probably more correct to say that we are at least 200,000 years old. This is because a mitochondrial line can go extinct. Some women throughout history may have not been able to, or never got the chance, to give birth to an offspring, so entire mitochondrial generations may have been lost. So it's quite possible, even probable, that some pieces of our genetic history were lost, and thus it's possible that our species may have started earlier than what we've calculated, but that evidence has been lost. Evidence of what I just said was already found. The Mungo remains are fossilized humans found near Lake Mungo in New South Wales, Australia. These remains of Aboriginal Australians are about 41,000 years old. In 2001, mitochondrial DNA from these remains was studied and compared with several other sequences. It was found to have more than the expected number of sequence differences when compared to modern human DNA. Comparison of the mitochondrial DNA with that of ancient and modern Aborigines led to the conclusion that the remains fell outside the range of genetic variation seen in Australian Aboriginal people today. Meaning, this specimen belongs to a maternal line that went extinct and whose genetic heritage cannot be found in modern humans. Before we continue, I'd like to ask you something. This channel has no sponsors, so if you enjoy the content I make, please consider supporting these videos by becoming a patron. You can check out my Patreon page by clicking here or find the link in the description. Ok, now we can move on to the next fact. So what exactly is mitochondrial DNA? This story is quite incredible. Nuclear and mitochondrial DNA are thought to be of separate evolutionary origin. Mitochondrial DNA is thought to have originated from the bacteria that were engulfed by the early ancestors of today's eukaryotic cells billions of years ago. The mitochondrion has its own independent genome that shows substantial similarity to bacterial genomes. In other words, mitochondria is the remnant of a bacteria that used to be eaten by others that developed a symbiotic relationship with its predators. 
This relationship lasts to this day as the mitochondrion organelle, among many other things, converts chemical energy from food into a form that cells can use, adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Now back to our story. The probability of mitochondrial DNA recovery is higher than that of nuclear DNA because in most cells you can find dozens, hundreds or even thousands of mitochondria, but only two pieces of nuclear DNA. Even so, until the 1980s, scientists could only extract mitochondrial DNA from perfectly preserved ancient remains, thus restraining the studied time period to, at most, a couple of thousand years. This changed when a new method of copying DNA segments was discovered, called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Using PCR, copies of DNA sequences are exponentially amplified to generate thousands to millions of more copies of that particular DNA segment. This enabled scientists to analyze much older samples. The DNA segments are then separated by size using laser beams to decode their molecular structure. These structures are then put together in specific ways, thus revealing sometimes an entire DNA sequence. In 1997, this method was used to extract 379 pairs of genes from the remains of a Neanderthal man. What they found and proved then was that Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals were not directly related, but evolved separately from a common ancestor. Mitochondrial DNA can reveal other things too. For instance, if some women in a group have a genetic mutation in their mitochondrion and women from another group don't have that mutation, then these two groups separated before this mutation occurred. And vice versa, if two completely separate groups present the same genetic mutations, then they aren't really that separate, but were once part of the same group. The diversity of mutations can also give us the size of the group. A large population will create more genetic diversity and mutations, while smaller groups tend to have a small number of common features. While this is a very complicated science, it actually enables us to determine a group's origin, its initial size, who they interacted with, where and when. In other words, we can study their migration paths and how it changed them. For instance, we know today that about 9,000 years ago, agriculture spread through Europe like wildfire from groups of Middle Eastern tribes, which gave rise to a demographic explosion that carried with it the genetic mutations from those ancient Europeans. We can also study modern populations thanks to mitochondrial DNA. Right at the northern tip of Scotland lie the Orkney Islands. Vikings used to pillage these islands frequently. Eventually, the locals transformed and adopted their culture. Initially, it was thought that the Vikings then formed the elite and remained separate from the locals. Mitochondrial DNA analysis shows us something else. The DNA of modern-day islanders is more similar to that of modern Norwegians than to that of their neighboring Celtic populations. Meaning, the Vikings didn't just rule, they mixed with the locals, creating the modern society of today. This and everything else we've talked about, coming from a cell's organelle, no larger than 3 square micrometers that was originally a separate bacteria, billions of years ago. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. The link is in the description. I hope to see you next time, bye.